Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode number 56 of In Focus Paranormal Talk Radio. My guest tonight is author and lecturer Peter Moon, perhaps best known for his work on the Montauk Project, which he'll share with us tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to bring him on, and uh, we'll get rolling. Ladies and gentlemen, without uh, any further ado, Mr. Peter Moon. Peter, how you doing? Hello. It's nice to be here. Well, you know, I really appreciate it, and uh, you've come uh, very highly recommended uh, by, you know, friends of mine out on the East Coast, and and fortunately it it took us into Season 2 to get a chance to connect and bring you on, but uh, you're here, so thank you. All right, where would you like to begin? Well, uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, for... Uh, my listeners who may not be familiar with uh, who you are and uh, your background, uh, just give us a little bit of an idea of uh, who you are and how you got involved in uh, studying things like uh, the Montauk Project. Okay. Um, you know, it's a very long and involved story, and I've, you know, published some 16 books, of, you know, which most of which talk about the subject in one form or another. And... It began for me in uh, 1990 when I met Preston Nichols, mm -hmm. who was one of the most foremost experts in the world on electromagnetics. And he, uh, I actually met him because he was an inventor, prolific inventor, and I wanted to find out about one of his inventions. Mm -hmm. And in going to meet him, it, which was at a public lecture, I, I heard these wild and strange stories about something called the Montauk Project which was a follow-through to the Philadelphia experiment in 1943, where the Navy had allegedly tried to make a ship appear invisible to the naked eye or to radar. And, it, and it, according to the accounts and legends, it actually disappeared. And the people on board had severe problems because they left this dimension. And they came back a little fried, to say the least. Now, when I first heard these stories before I met Preston, I heard a little bit about them. I thought they were absolutely ludicrous. When I heard Preston, I was listening to not only him, but, but a, a couple of people who had a very visceral involvement in the experiments. So it, it, it came home, it rang very true. And then these experiments continued out in uh, Long Island, New York, first at Brookhaven Labs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Philadelphia experiment was studied and uh, after the war, it was taken to Brookhaven Labs, where the, where the people were nearby, studied. Mm -hmm. And the whole subject was taken on anew and eventually resulted in full-scale time experiments. Now, I've, I've covered a lot of ground in a few short words there, but that's, that's the background as to how I became involved as I heard this story by Preston. And when I heard this story, I asked if there was a book I could read on it. No, there was none. So about six months later, Preston and I worked out an agreement to write a book. And we wrote this book and published it in 1992. And I guess in a few months' time, 3,000 copies went out, out the door. So that's how I became a known commodity in the paranormal community. And that, that's where my begins. I had an extensive background prior to that. I was in advertising, but my paranormal background was in Scientology, the controversial movement, mm -hmm. and I worked in the, the personal office of L. Ron Hubbard. So I had a, and he is of course the the founder of the remote viewing techniques, which are so popular in uh, conspiracy circles. They're talked about, but they're not very well understood. And this is sort of my background to be able to deal with this subject, which was a very I guess for most people would be an impossible to deal with subject. And and that's sort of a little bit about my background. Yeah, impossible to deal with um, for, uh, you know, a fair percentage of the population, to say the least. So, um, and, and you, as you said, the, uh, the uh, Montauk uh, project grew out of 
the Philadelphia experiment, and uh, this all pretty much uh, seemed to take on a life of its own, its own up there at uh, uh, Camp Hero, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yes, Camp Hero is the name of the Air Force Station at Montauk, New York, which is at the eastern tip of Long Island. The south, there's a east. Long Island goes into two forks. They're called the North Fork and the South Fork. At the end of the South Fork is Montauk Point, which there was a radar station out there for the 1950s radar, which was to detect. It's called the Eastern Shield, and if Russians or other invaders were coming over the water, the Atlantic Ocean, the radar, the SAGE radar, would pick up the planes coming. Now, if you have a radar of that size, which is the, 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 it's still out there to this day, it's sort of a historical monument, but if you have all that radar taking in, you have to take the information into a secure place underneath. So they had an extensive bunker system down there when it's in an underground, which is still secret to this day. They will not release the blueprints of the Montauk Underground. I, I was going to say there is some uh, pretty extensive infrastructure uh, out there uh, on Montauk Point, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yes, and, and in 1994, there was a, uh, it was 93, there was a court case because my colleagues Preston Nichols and Duncan Cameron had been out there and they wouldn't let you go on the property. And this it was supposedly a state park, so it was a violation of of uh, New York state law to have a park that was where two thirds of the property was not available to the public. Mm -hmm. This was violating a statute. So Preston and Duncan were hauled into court because they were on what we call the forbidden zone, and they won the court case because saying, oh, "Look at it, it's a state park," and there was a question of sign postage. It embarrassed the government. Well, I couldn't imagine. In fact, it was so controversial that the district attorney told them, told a friend of mine who came to watch, I couldn't go that day, he told him to leave the building. They saved that court case to last. They did everybody, they saved this to last, and they told him to leave the building. And he said, no, it's a public hearing. I will not leave. They couldn't make him leave. And... Um, the judge had sympathy for Preston because he says, I used to walk out there, walk his dog out there. He says, how do I know I'm not on the illegal property? So basically, a Bernadette Castro, who was the Parks Commissioner of New York State, mm -hmm. um, got Superfund money. It's called Superfund for cleaning up defense bases. And they began a cleanup project of the base because there's a lot of toxic stuff supposedly left over. and mm -hmm. They opened up the park to the public, so you can go out there, and they have all these picnic tables all over Inner Camp Hero, which is hysterical because nobody's going to picnic out there. Yeah, I was going to say it, it, it's a little disconcerting to say the uh, the very least. You've got picnic tables and a decommissioned military facility. Well, yes, now it's sort of a tourist place, but there is still a known presence there that would, uh, you know, ostensibly go underground. There's certain areas that have you know, left their markers of, of you know, clandestine activity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there was an experience, I, I don't remember the date, it was probably about uh, seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. where I actually saw mutilated deer on the base itself, right in the oh. vicinity of the transmitter tower. Oh, One was a spectacular mutilation. I, I didn't have a video camera at that time. I wish I would have had video footage of it. It was quite disgusting. But it was a classic mutilation. Uh, much, uh, much like uh, what uh, gets attributed to uh, the aftermath of UFO sightings, by chance. Well, some say it's black helicopters. I don't know what it is. The, the, to tell you the truth, the the the, the deer, which has a big buck with big antlers, mm -hmm. looked like it had been dropped from a helicopter. You know, and then just plotted down like it had been crunched. Uh huh. That's and right. it was. Uh, it was quite violent. However, that that poor animal died. That's yeah. that 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 rings uh, a few bells, but it's disconcerting nonetheless. To 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 put it mildly. 
Uh, it, 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 exactly, but but as they say, there's a lot of strange things. We have uh, movies of birds acting irregular out there because part of what they did at Montauk was to control the uh, moods of human beings and animals. So according to the stories, they could emit a radio frequency which would change and alter the mood. So, you know, according to the stories, animals would go crazy in the town. Well, we've got pictures of animals going crazy right over Camp Hero, flying around in circles and acting quite mad. And this is in the, right in the vicinity of a, of a radar dish that was put out there by the Cardian Radar Corporation in 1993. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, you know, Montauk's always been a center of high strangeness for those who, you know, wish to open their minds to investigating. Uh, I was just going to say, you, um, from what you described, that sounds relatively similar to uh, what's been described with the uh, HARP project up in Alaska, as far as the low-frequency radio waves and supposedly being used to uh, alter certain states of consciousness. Well, yes, the HARP, the HARP project... Um, it's gone through various gestations. I do not claim to be an expert on HARP per se, but HARP is generally an outgrowth of what was initially researched at Montauk mm -hmm. and was run at one point, according to my sources, from Brookhaven Labs. Still might be. Um, you know, I don't keep, it's hard to keep track of these things. And HARP is a multifaceted um, vehicle, which I also believe has some positive aspects to it, um, from what I've heard, it, it would also have functions that would protect us from sun, you know, mm -hmm. what do you call those, sunstorms and whatnot, that uh, they yeah, get a little too aggressive. Time. So, yeah, that, that, that was uh, something that, that I found kind of interesting. Um, I know a friend of mine who I believe you're acquainted with, uh, John Nowinski, I know. Right, yeah, he went out to Montauk time. one time uh, in the same time I was there, yes. Yeah, I know he's he's been out there a couple of times and has, uh, you know, shared with me uh, uh, on a number of occasions just how, uh, and I use this word rather loosely because, you know, I know when he, when he uses it, it makes me kind of cringe that he said that it's rather interesting and Knowing John, if anything, you know, piques his interest, <laughs> it, it would make uh, it would make the majority of people somewhat uh, blanch, <laughs> because uh, John's kind of, as you know, he's kind of an interesting guy, and and obviously his interests are, you know, akin to my own. And it, when you get involved in a subject like uh, like this, like the paranormal. Uh, your, you know, your whole worldview kind of shifts. So if you find something interesting, uh, the general populace might find it scary as hell. Well, yes, and and this is this is a a problem with the whole subject is that some people are not acclimated to it. Mm -hmm. Some people have grown up in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's second nature to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I know my daughter grew up with a little girl who, who used to see ghosts. It was always second nature to her and her family. Are they particularly, you know, paranormal people? Not particularly. It's just second nature to them. So, so there's varying different. And some people, it would, it would be the work of the devil. Some people, it would scare the living daylights out of it. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, it's different. But it, it creates a lot of misunderstandings and controversy. Right now we have... Uh, since John began his ghost hunting or whatever he did, he does more than ghost hunting, but he was oh, doing it he back did. on Halloween yeah. days in Quite Connecticut. Now everybody has got a ghost show on TV, and these things are not highly evolved encounters. It's, it's people trying to make contact or establish that there's something out there beyond the normal, mm -hmm. you know, what one sees normally. But... The, the one thing people have to remember is the human eye is, and perception, their ears, are only open to certain, you know, frequencies. 
we, we do not span the entire spectrum as far as what we can see and hear. Like a dog can hear things we cannot hear. Exactly. So our perception is very limited. Now, our brain has the potential to hear everything. And this is what somebody, you put them on a hallucinogenic drug, and they can hear things that ostensibly wouldn't be there. But that's because their brain is unfiltered. And there's what Aldous Huxley called a reducing valve, which is just a functional name that reduces things so we can perceive it and, you know, focus and have what would be called a, what we would call a sane life in society where we, we're not filtering all the chaos. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, when one studies the paranormal, they're, they're, they're looking out beyond that filter and it can become chaotic. And for the unwary, you know, traveler or experiencer, it, it, depending upon their personal orientation mm -hmm. and fortitude, it, it, it can be uh, a bad experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, you know, and I have a number of, of friends, obviously, uh, who are involved in this subject since I've, you know, spent the last 10 or 12 years, you know, researching UFOs and the like myself. I mean, the sort of the running exchange between uh, John and, and myself is, this would be weird, except, well, it's us. <laughs> because, I mean, you you really do become acclimated to it, and uh, what was once paranormal is the new normal. Because you just become used to, you know, things uh, like you mentioned before, ghosts and... Uh, uh, extrasensory perception it's a, it's a different part of life it's it's a different part of life and I, I would suppose if consciousness is going to expand you're going to get you know things become more acceptable but which ghost, ghosts have always been somewhat acceptable to people or we wouldn't have stories about them and then you know you have things like Casper the friendly ghost and all this sort of stuff which which gives people a familiarity even if even if they don't you know, believe in it. They they have a familiarity from watching TV or or whatnot, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a part of life. And it the question is, how much does a certain individual want to engage in it in their own life? You know, a ditch digger might not have much need to think about ghosts. Um, it depends on the individual and the, and the situation. When we're dealing with Montauk and the Montauk project, what's what's amazing about it is it's opening up the whole can of worms of consciousness that's that's tying so many things together and is taking us to a I guess what you'd say the it's beyond the PhD in metaphysics maybe you don't have the understanding but it's it's what PhDs who went beyond metaphysics were experimenting with so we're dealing with time the machinations of time what is time now there's, there's a very interesting corollary to this whole story, which I don't think you're familiar with, Nick, because we haven't talked about it, but what's developed since the adventure's initial forays in the Montauk Project, because when I first began to investigate it, I found a lot of occult correspondences, which I put in a book called Montauk Revisited Adventures in Synchronicity, followed by a book called Pyramids of Montauk, which where I discovered that there were ancient pyramids on the land where the uh, experiments took place and that the family that those pyramids belonged to were the pharaohs, the pharaohs of the Montauk Indians. And that this was Montauk Indian land, that the Indians had been declared extinct uh, unfairly because they do exist to this day. And that's a whole other story. So that the, there was, a, I guess, a continuing investigation which just began to reveal more and more information but there's, there's another point I was alluding to mm -hmm. I had a monthly meeting on Long Island with Preston Nichols it was called Montauk Night where we would meet people who had been involved in the Montauk project or wanted to find out about it and we exchange information we tell them what we knew and they would tell us what they knew that was the whole idea of it mm -hmm. and one evening in 1999 about seven years after the book had come out a man by the name of Dr. David Anderson came to visit us at one of these Montauk nights, and he was interested in time travel. 
he was a subscriber to my uh, quarterly newsletter, which I still have in Action, the Montauk Pulse. And I should also mention that anybody who wants to look into this further, read the books, or subscribe to the newsletter can go to my website, uh, www.skybooksusa.com, skybooksusa.com. But anyway, um, David Anderson had a time travel research center on Long Island in the 90s. And he had been hired, well, he worked for the Air Force. He was recruited by the Air Force at a young age. And while in the Air Force, they put him on a, a problem they had because satellites in outer space, would their orbits would decay several meters every year. Mm -hmm. So how can we fix this? They put him on this because he was an expert in mathematics and physics. And he had a very special interest in Einstein's special theory of relativity, and he figured out a way to actually warp space and time um, and keep these satellites in orbit, mm -hmm. keep them, maintain their orbit. Now, how he does how he does this does this is um, you know is is better explained by him than me, and, and he does have a website, the Anderson Institute. And But the thing is, he patented this technology when he left the Air Force. And he developed it further and created the Time Travel Research Center, which he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to have a museum and teach people about time because he had, had a very unique insight to this stuff. And what he did, he got a lot of in private investment because if you can, slow things and speed things up in time, particularly slow them down, you can preserve organs. So the medical industry was very interested in him being able to slow down a heart, slow down a liver, so it could be transplanted into this. And he was able to slow and speed up time in a, a field the size of a soccer ball. And he came into my life and put up my first website, and he was very interested in my writing of the Montauk Project, the writing I was doing about time, and he had a different approach to time travel than Preston Nichols. His was strictly, um, well, it seems strictly academic, whereas Preston's was so avant-garde, you know, academic people wouldn't understand it. David was more academic. However, David even exceeds beyond what the, the normal physicist can understand. And David appeared in my life for a few years, 1999, 2001, after 9-11, he was sent on a secret mission to Moscow by the government. And he told me that if he didn't return in two weeks to make noise, he didn't return in two weeks, three weeks. I made noise. He got in touch with me. He came back in January from November. He was gone about a couple months. And his time travel research center began to be attacked. He had to basically shut it down, the one on Long Island. Okay. He had one in New Mexico, which stayed alive, but he said he withdrew his uh, majority ownership of it because the government said they'd make his security problems go away if he would give them ownership of it, partial ownership. Mm -hmm. So he left the one in New Mexico intact and went into the security business. He left it alone. And he gave me all of his archival stuff that he had, his books for the Time Travel Museum, and he said, I won't be able to work with you for five years. And that was in 2003. Then, in 2003, there was a great discovery in a location where he had another time travel research center. He had three research centers. One was in Long Island, one was in New Mexico, and the other one was in Romania. And yeah. he told me that he had one in Romania because Romanians, he said, are the best mathematicians in the world. And they were also very affordable because their economy was depressed. So he had a, a research center set up there, which he said was theoretical. And they did a lot of number crunching. And in 1999, right before he had met me, he had just been on his first trip to a conference called Atlanticron in Romania, where 
is a gathering of science fiction writers, scientists, artists, and they would was sort of a think tank which had developed into a uh, sort of a summer academy for Romanian youth, ages 15 to 30. And he was going to lecture and made a presentation to them on time. Now, he always said he wanted to take me there. He wanted me to come to that. And he, he established the World Genesis Foundation, which was a, a charity, a charitable 501c3 IRS-approved corporation for helping artists and writers, you know, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So this, he helped fund this Atlanticron conference that would occur every year. So he had disappeared from my life for the most part from 1901 uh, from 1901, from 2001 to 2000, in 2003 to 2008. But in 2003, there was a great discovery in Romania. And there's a sphinx in Romania that most people do not know about. A sphinx? A sphinx, yes. It's, it's high above the tree line in the Buchegi Mountains, just not far from, you know, uh, southeast Transylvania. Ah. And... He, that, well, he didn't discover this, but what they used his satellites, uh, the satellites he'd worked on, they had gr the Pentagon had ground-penetrating radar that was coming out of satellites, and they noticed a chamber underneath the Sphinx, and that it had no, it, it looked, it was contoured such as it must be a man-made chamber, mm -hmm. but there was no entrances to it. They wanted to know what was there. So in 2003, I think it was 2003, maybe it was 2005, for I received a book about this whole investigation that took place. It was a Romanian book. And they had a secret psychic department in uh, Romania back in the communist days, which you know existed and continued when, when they changed over in 1989 to a democracy. And... The psychic named Cesar Brad, or we, we would pronounce it Cesar Brad, he, he um, was destined, he was born into the secret department, or monitored by it with a huge umbilical cord. They knew he was psychic because he had a huge umbilical cord and they couldn't cut it. So he was reported to their secret you know, X-Files department, which they called Department Zero. He grew up after being schooled by a red Chinese doctor named Dr. Zen to be the head of this department. And when he was on the head of this department, the Pentagon had discovered this chamber underneath the Sphinx. And the result was a high-level Freemason from Italy called Signor Mazzini, who was a part of the Bilderberger group, came and he went to Romania and he basically said to Caesar, and, and Caesar was amazed because he didn't even know how could this person even know that he existed? Because there was hardly anybody who knew of his existence. Most Romanian intelligence people didn't even know he existed. And this guy came to him and said, because he was in charge of all secret activity in Romania, they wanted his help to recover what was in this chamber. And Caesar described this man as a very evil man. Okay. And who had, you know, his controls into society, controls into the Pentagon. And he... Uh, Basically, through his connections, he, he got the Americans to come into Romania and dig into this chamber. It would, took a lot of work. Now, what's interesting is what they find in this chamber is, is completely amazing. And I, I'm going to tell you what it is in a second, but I can't vouch for it personally what's in there because I haven't seen it. The author of this book, Radu Sinemar, or Radu Sinemar, as we'd say in English, He's the writer of this book. He actually saw it because okay. he was taken there by his boss, Caesar. He worked in Department Zero as well, still does. And, but what happens when the Americans come into this chamber and help the Romanians dig it up, there is a, an alliance between Romania and America that you can actually see in the papers. You can see that Romania has become a part of NATO and that Air Force bases are being in, built in Romania. So you see a coziness between Romania and America that never existed before. Uh, once these things go into place, once this, this great chamber is discovered. So 
what's in the chamber is a big table that's about six feet high that would ostensibly be built by some alien creature that's very tall. Uh, that's the most obvious answer. Whether that's true or not, we really don't know. But um, Radu would go in there and put his hand over the, the table, and it would read out his DNA. It would get a DNA print out of what's, what his DNA is. If he puts the hand down, it would make it bigger, you know, like a zoom, zoom effect. Okay. And on another part of the table, another square on the table, he put a hand over and it would read out, it would show a star system where ostensibly there was an, 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 a DNA readout of another type of a creature that would ostensibly come from a different star system. If he put over his hand over one square and, and say the, the square where he originally did, it would show a combination of the DNA. So in other words, this was a, a DNA computer device that was holographic in nature, that would, that would read out holograms. And so this is a very sophisticated technology that they're discovering. There was also a place called the projection hole where it would read out the history of the world in a, in a holographic form, but it would be contoured to the person watching it. So if you watched it, you might see a different history than I would see. Because, I mean, you know, the history is, is infinite. So it would obviously be a summated history. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't watch the entire thing. Uh, it would take forever. Um, the Earth is so big and so vast. Exactly. But it would have a consolidated history. So this is a, you know, an incredible story, which uh, Radu, the author, has corresponded me and assured me to the best of ability that this is true. And what I did is I took this book mm -hmm. and I, that they had written in Romanian and they had translated it into Euro-English and I translated it further into American English. Mm -hmm. And they called the book The Enemy Inside or The Enemy Within because they wanted to alert the Romanian people of what was occurring on their land and that this, there was a, a fight for this land between the, the Freemasons of Italy, the Bilderberger Group, and the Americans, and, and the Romanian insiders in Department Zero that wanted to keep it clean and share it with humanity. And the book I, I published in English last year, it's called, Trans I, I changed the title to Transylvanian Sunrise. Mm -hmm. And it's by Redu Cinemar with Peter Moon, myself. And I, now I also go into that book it's a lot of the books about the political intrigue surrounding this whole scenario. And in 19, 2008, after David, he, he contacts me again. I haven't really seen him or been with him for f over five years. And he invites me to Romania to this, attend this conference. And I'm hoping that, oh, boy, I'm going to get to see, you know, some There's wild things. Some, yes. Number and, of pardon me? I said that you were hoping to see the Sphinx as well as many other things, I'm sure. I did see the Sphinx. I went there, and unfortunately, um, David had said on the phone that he says, well, I know, he, I asked him if he knew Radu, and he says, I don't want to talk about that on the phone. And then I get emails from Radu telling me, I want to come to America, but I, I won't feel safe talking to you in Romania. I can't see you in Romania. It's, it's too... Too much security. Too delicate situation. I'm yeah, sure. but so he was comfortable talking to me in America, and David was comfortable talking to me in Romania. He says, we'll talk about that when we get to Romania. When I got to Romania, first I went to the Sphinx. There was a lot of confusion with our travel arrangements, and we, that's about the only thing I did get to see was the Sphinx, because they wanted to have us give us a cultural tour of Romania. Then, you know, I go to Atlanticron, and David, unfortunately, was not able to talk because he, he finally opened up and said that he had mergers underway. He was taking back control of the Time Travel Research Center after five years. And he had a new company called Anderson Multinational. And he was back in the time travel business. And somehow he knew intuitively that he wouldn't be able to talk to me for five years. And even this five years, he wasn't able to say much. But I was able to go there, um, have an interesting trip, and, you know, meet with him again. 
And the following year, 2009, I went back where he lectured extensively on time travel. And the biggest secret or clue he revealed was that, phys and he says there was only four physicists in the world that understood this, you know, big time physicists. The rest of them just don't get it, is that time is distance. We think of time as an abstract form, and most physicists do, but it's actually completely computable to a distance. Because if you look at the second hand on a clock, it moves a distance, okay? 60 yeah. ticks. Exactly. That is a distance. Now, the distance becomes important because when you can put time as a distance, there's something in physics called the invariance of the space-time interval. And that's a real mouthful. Exactly. I think it has it on Wikipedia, and I, I wrote an article in one of the newsletters to, to clarify it. But basically, you can, when you put it time in a distance, you can put it into the triangle of a Pythagorean theorem, and you can begin to compute. And time, it's like, like in a football field. If you're going backwards or forwards, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can go... I mean, football is not the best analogy for time, but it, but it is functional because in, in terms of pure science, you can go from an event backwards or forwards because it's about distance. It's not about time. This gets very esoteric from the way we normally think, but, but this was something he lectured on quite extensively in a, in a series of lectures he called The Time Machine. Now, most of this information is available now on his website, which he had put up and you look up the Anderson Institute, David Anderson, Anderson, Anderson Multinational. I don't, you know, you, you, you'll find, you can, you can read till the cows come home about stuff that he's written about time. Um, and he recently, and this is very interesting, came out with a, on his website, mm -hmm. uh, he's got a patent pending on what's called a time reactor. And a time reactor is, is an extension of, of the what I was talking about earlier, the space-time model he created for the satellites and for slowing things down. Mm -hmm. Through the principle of fra frame dragging, which is, I guess, what you call a displacement that occurs as an orbiting body is, you know, or as a, what do you call it, a, an orb, like a planet, when it spins around, it, you know, Mm -hmm. There's this what's called frame dragging, and he's figured out how to harness the energy from that. And this will solve our energy problems. It makes all the, the solar power and windmills unnecessary. It's completely moot. Yes. And so you see, you know, in, in what we're dealing with here is, is a subject that, that conspiracy author Ken Thomas calls parapolitics. We're dealing, you know, above politics because... David has said, he says, when something's released to the public, the government's already had it for 20 years. Yeah, and I would imagine at least. Yeah, like a laptop or, or a cell phone. So, so basically, he said that there are some competitors in the time field, time control technologies, but he's probably the leading one. So obviously, if he's got a patent pending on this, the government is fully aware of it. And... There are a lot of people in the government that don't like these repressive controls, so I guess there's wars going on in there that you never see. But, but this is like the cutting edge of where my research into time has led me, and I will be going back to Romania again this summer to this a conference, which has become a center point for you know, intrigue and interest for, for what's going on. Which, which all began with the Montauk Project. Um, so we're beginning to understand. We're, we're coming to a horizon of understanding. And it's very interesting with the end of the Mayan calendar in 2012, which is the end of time as we know it, that David Anderson would be coming online with all his, his uh, explanations about time, which is adding to mankind's knowledge. Yeah, it's going to add, add into the intrigue, I'm sure. Yes, so, so it's going to become a lot more interesting. You know, here we are in the beginning of 2010, and then in two years from now, you know, how this has progressed, 
uh, it's it's going to continue to progress and continue to get more interesting. And you know, some of us will stick with it and hang around, and some people will go by the boards. That's just the way life is. It's uh, it's cyclic. So, you know, there's been a lot of uh, intriguing things that have happened in my life in the last two years, which I've, I've you know shared a bulk of them here, but the world is slow to hear about these things because certainly the media does not, uh, you know, they like to, they like to circulate uh, pablum, uh, coupled by the fact that I've noticed that a lot of people, you know, they, they'd rather watch something mundane on TV, like a reality show. They don't, they don't want to hear about the, the biting truth of political events. You know that that that's really true, and uh, you know I think, and this is just me speaking personally, but I think if we would, if we would take some of the uh, the real mundane uh, garbage, for lack of a better word, off of uh, the airwaves and uh, replace it with something of even moderate intellectual value, I think uh, on the whole. Uh, society might be better off. Well, there's no question, but intellectualism is virtually dead. It's it's not a desired commodity by the individuals in society. Okay. They'd rather watch a reality show. Believe me, I, I know all too well what you're, uh, you know, where, where you're coming from. And, and even one of the, uh, I guess, the authors who was an intellectual author I think it was John Updike had said when he was an up-and-coming writer, he said there were all these publications. He said, there are no publications you can write anymore. To write an essay or to write a thing, they don't exist. You know, in other words, you, you, you know, he became a novelist, but he got his, his fledgling start by publishing articles. He says these, these things don't exist anymore. You know, so, so it's like your, your intellectual class is, well, you know, you, you do have intellects on the Internet to a certain extent, but, you know, it's, it, I guess for the people who want to learn, the Internet is a tool whereby they can learn things despite all the, you know, nonsense that's on the Internet. Uh, the medium evolves. and uh, Exactly. Thereby, thereby uh, your chosen field evolves and uh, so on and so forth. But, you know, I, like you said, Peter, on the whole... It seems to me that, that people don't want to learn or don't want to be challenged. And I, I just, I, I personally find that kind of sad. Well, there, there is a lot of uh, what you'd say reasons to be uninspired if, if you look for them. You can also look for reasons to, to be inspired as, as well. I mean, I mean, just the information I'm telling you uh, mm -hmm. does not come from me. It comes through me. But it doesn't, you know, I did not invent David Anderson. You know, he is making a, a brilliant uh, strides. And, and it, you know, the interesting thing is that conference in, in Romania, which basically goes back to, it's a, it's a little island on the Danube where we have it. And, and it's once a year it's, it's reserved um, with sanctioned by the government and the government protects it for us. And were allowed to be there, but it was started by um, Sorin Rapinovich, who works for the Department of Energy, but he, as a little boy, his father used to take him fishing there, and he had an interest in science fiction. And one of the themes one year they called Atlantic Cron, where science fiction uh, becomes reality. And the tagline of my company, Skybooks, is where science fiction meets reality. So we, we, you know, we have a common purpose there that I would have to go all the way to Romania to, you know, exercise it is kind of intriguing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, it's... It, it, and David has also stressed that, that Romania is a very important point for expansion from the Orient. China, see, Romania is a way station between Europe and China, between East and West. So there will be a lot of expansion in that country just through the Chinese connection. And the Chinese were connected there when they were communist times. So there's some, you know, they're old comrades. Ah, so so well, it's a central... Understandable, then. 
Yes, and when you put the Stargate concept into this, which I just did with this, with this uh, chamber underneath the Sphinx, because in sequels to the book, which I've not read or published, I hope to be publishing them in the future, is that there's three tunnels in that chamber, which lead, one of them leads to a similar chamber in Egypt, underneath the Sphinx of Giza. Mm -hmm. One leads to uh, Tibet, with an offshoot to Baghdad and an offshoot to Mongolia with similar installations. And a third one goes into the bowels of the inner earth, which I don't know exactly where that one goes, ostensibly to beings or some civilization there. Um, so, so there's a lot, I guess what you'd say, a lot of potential. And, and if this chamber is what I've been told it is, it would seem to have incredible answers for humanity. Mm -hmm. And it's not good enough for me personally that I get to write about it or perhaps even see it someday. I don't know if that will happen. It's not, it's not good enough. It, it's something that has to be distributed to, for the benefit of all mankind, On those of us who are willing to reach out for it. That, that's the real key here. Understandable. And we hear this story, and then... You know, what good? But then again, as you see, mankind is not necessarily all that interested in evolving. Some people are, or we wouldn't be on the radio talking about it. Exactly. But some people would rather be watching a reality show and eating, you know, whatever infernal concoctions that grocery stores give to people in ways of sugar. You know, you take away a person's sugar and it can create quite a lot of upset. This is true. Uh, going back to uh, Montauk, uh, uh, specifically Montauk, uh, uh, it must have been what three, four years ago now. The uh, the beach where they found uh, what was termed the Montauk Monster. Do you yep. uh, know know real much about that? Well, it was funny. It was a funny story when I received it. Uh, that news. I had about five emails from people, and I was actually in Transylvania, you know, the, the renowned land of monsters, mm -hmm. in a ski resort, you know. Uh, it was summertime. And I, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, they're telling me about monsters at Montauk, and here I am in Transylvania. It was very funny when I received that. Um, all There have been two other monsters that have come up since that initial one. One was in Center Island, on the north shore mm -hmm. of Long Island. It was somewhat similar. The picture of it wasn't too good, but it was a similar story where somebody carted it away. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they call the authorities and somebody carts it away and they, they don't have enough pictures. They didn't... And then, then that only made one small press. And then there was another one, I think it occurred on the north shore of Long Island. So there have been three of these things that have um, appeared similar but different. And, of course, they're attributed to Plum Island, which is the island mm -hmm. off the coast of Long Island, which has got all sorts of secret biological experiments taking place there for some time. Mm -hmm. We don't know what these monsters are. Um, you know, the Indians said that these things have always existed. So I, I don't really know whether it's a weird experiment or something from another dimension, but it's certainly an oddity. And, and it, it certainly, at least to my mind, uh, doesn't fit the, uh, the cover story that was uh, circulating at the time. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know what the cover story was other than they found something weird and they didn't know what it was, and then it kind of, like, disappeared. Uh, well, to my recollection anyway uh it was described as some sort of a of a hybrid really and uh, it, as best i can recall because i i was out in uh, connecticut at that time um with uh, the aforementioned mr nowinski and uh, i remember he and i just looking at each other dumbstruck and saying, can you believe this? 
just uh, honestly, it was just <laughs> t- to me it, the thought was okay. How are you going to explain away whatever the bloody hell this thing is, especially on the beach with people around and everything else? So it just uh, the the story, as I best recall it, was that uh, it was trying the the powers that be, you know, whether that be simply be the news media, uh, were trying to explain it away as a result of just some sort of uh, genetic mutation, not necessarily experimentation or anything of that nature. Well, there but, there have been extensive experimentations. Uh, actually, going back to Montauk, they were experimenting with sea creatures back in the, you know, 60s. You know, in Fort Pond Bay, they had a whole, New York State had a whole oceanographic institute that was doing strange stuff out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Brookhaven Labs, you know, to this day, when you go on a tour there, they say, we do not have aliens here, do not ask us about aliens. And this is far before the Montauk Project was circulating strange stuff into them. You know, they've always had to deal with these rumors. You know, my my whole thought, uh, dealing with, you know, strange creatures and, and, and things like this, um, it was awfully, you know, my feeling was just that it was awfully interesting that it happened in such close proximity to both Camp Hero and and to the facility at Plum Island that you know that that uh, just you know taken by itself it might not uh, mean much or might not otherwise uh, grab like, the, well even the fact that they called it the Montauk Monster was just you know it, it got press on you know on Channel Five it was known as the Montauk Monster. You know, Fox News. I mean, so, I mean, it's got a reputation. It's it's named after Montauk. So any monster that comes up is going to be called another Montauk monster. Mm-hmm. With perhaps Drew, per, perhaps, a, you know, the that's due and proper due to the Montauk Project stories. Well, I mean, it just, uh, you know, be, being, uh, you know, somebody that spends, you know, my free time involved in, all things paranormal. It, it certainly. Uh, it, it was kind of a moment. Well, well, hang on. Well, I should also mention when we're talking about Plum Island, is that the uh, the disease known as Lyme's disease, supposedly named after Lyme, Connecticut, is is a real misdirection, because it was originally called Montauk Knee because it originated uh, in the vicinity of Montauk with all the deer ticks in Montauk, and, and you can look that up on the internet. Montauk Knee. The hidden story of Montauk Knee is, is what they'll never talk about in books about Lyme disease, is that it was actually, and Preston Nichols researched this, uh, it, it was um, started when, when they were creating uh, biological warfare and out in that Plum Island area and in affiliation with Montauk and whatnot. They wanted to create something, that, uh, biological entity that would survive an atom bomb and drop it on Japan. And they found that a deer tick would survive an atom bomb. And they infected the deer ticks with the spirochete virus, which is essentially oh, syphilis. I was going to say that one of the components of syphilis, yes. Yes. So, so you see, well, once they started experimenting with this, and they also buried atomic waste at Montauk. That, that's a, you know, that, that's a, you know, stories I've heard, you know. And, and you know, I mean, I've had I've had I've legal heard. people tell me to shut up about it because you know, you know, I mean, I don't know how you can, well, you, but anyway, these because it all happened around Montauk. This is where the Montauk knee started forming, and then years later, when it became more prevalent, I guess they switched the location to Lyme, Connecticut, where it also you know things go over the sound. But there's a lot of misdirection there, so there, there's a, a great history of biological nonsense on Long Island, and of course everything it just extends over the Sound of Connecticut as well. Sort of uh, to uh, to borrow a sports analogy, uh, 
it, it's a bit like uh, Muhammad Ali's rope dope show left, go right. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly yeah. And, right. and it's like you have, I, I once met a woman who wrote an entire book on Lyme disease. She didn't know anything about Montauk me. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't think the woman was a stupid woman. I think, you know, she researched it as best she could. And uh, She didn't have the whole story. Exactly. You don't have the whole story. You bury something because you don't want it found. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, we live in a world of, of uh, buried, buried secrets. And, of course, this is my job to dig them up and, and uh, you know, it, it makes life, I guess, uh, interesting. I was I was going to say I you know I consider it uh, you know part of part of my job to uh, you know dig into things that other people might not uh, want to and uh, that's you know that's why I have the friends I have and that's why I keep the company I keep so it's uh, yes and there are a lot of people doing it and there's a lot of people you know interested in this and this these are the times we live in and it's uh, um, an interesting time to be alive and there's. Yeah. It makes life wonderfully interesting when you can uh, wax intellectual about subjects most people have never heard of or given two seconds worth of thought. Exactly. Well, we're down to just about the last three minutes or so. Um, if you would, just give us a little bit of an overview of uh, what's upcoming for you. Uh, if you're working on a new book, uh, lectures, something like that. Well, I mean, if if anybody's, are we local in New York here? Or are we? Uh, we're 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 live. I'm in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but uh, oh, I thought you were in New York because that was a six four six number. The uh, uh, no, the uh, the uh, switchboard for Blog Talk Radio is local to New York. Okay, so anyway, I mean, for those in New York, I'll be at the Disclosure Network on February fourteenth. I think it's at two p.m. The Disclosure Network in uh, in New York, you can look that up. Uh, that's in Greenwich Village. We meet in Greenwich Village at the Gay Lesbian Center. They have a, a meeting hall there for us. Um, it's not just for gays and lesbians, by the way. Um, I'll be there. And then I will be going back to Burlington, Wisconsin. If you're up there with Mary Sutherland's, she's going to have a conference with me as one of the members, and I'd probably be in the summertime, but she hasn't told me. So I've been to, you know, flown into Milwaukee twice. Just so you know, Nick. Yeah, I've yeah, I'm familiar very loosely with, you know, the conferences and things that are held down in uh, in Burlington. Uh, you get me a date, and if I'm free, I'll you know I'll be glad to put in an appearance. And yeah, yeah, yes, and then, um, you know, I'm I'm recently published a book called Montauk: The Book of the Living, which consolidates a lot of. Uh, work of the past and, and, you know, brings up some very interesting uh, concepts about, you know, quantum physics and as well as uh, some of the more esoteric components of, of history, including the secret of the virgin birth. And, and this is an incredible thing that nobody really takes and runs with because it's too dumbfounding, but that would require a whole other subject. We can't go into that. Well, um, you know, we uh We'll always uh, we can always bring you on uh, another time and continue the discussion. Yeah, we 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 could go into a whole deep thing about that, which you know I I can send you a book or something on it. But um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll be uh, I hope to be publishing the sequel to Radu Cinemar's Transylvanian Sunrise, which is a very interesting book. I would recommend people read it if they're interested in some of the things I talked about here, and of course the Montauk Project. And I will be uh, you know I will be continuing to write. You know, right now my my focus is on I want to do, I want to do those sequels. Well, um, you know, we're we're just under a minute left, and Peter, uh, the hours flown by. I uh, appreciate it so much, and uh, you know, get back in touch. Uh, I'd love to have you back on. Yes, and I'll mention the, the website again: skybooksusa.com. www.skybooksusa.com. Peter Moon, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Bye-bye. Have a nice night. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.